preface to a cookbook. An elderly gentleman who found me a bore once asked me desperately, Are you fond of literature? I dote upon it, I said. He was a painter. We had met at a kind of tea where everyone was talking of art and literature and things like that. We hated each other at once because each had been told that the other was interesting. Oh, you dote on it, he said, after a moment of venomous silence. I do, I replied firmly. He sneered. It was evident that he wished me to understand that he was incredulous. Sir, I said, striving with all the rancor of my nature to be offensive, Sir, are you fond of literature? I am, he said, putting on a pair of eyeglasses and looking as if he might look like Whistler if he thought me worth wasting the look on. What sort of literature are you fond of? I asked. I am fond of Lord Tennyson's poems, he retorted insultingly. I permitted myself a faint, superior smile. It maddened him, as I intended it should. His nose turned a whitish blue as the blood receded from his face. Did you ever read any of Meredith? I asked. I did, he replied. I turned toward the fireplace, as if willing to veil a doubt. He took off his glasses. He pointed at me a long, bony digit that trembled with anger. Did you? Yes, I said. What? he demanded. For one thing, I told him, the egoist. I dwelt upon the egoist as if I tasted a subtle, ulterior jest just in mentioning it to him. I hoped that would puzzle him. One of Meredith's lesser-known pieces, no doubt, he said. Oh, no, I affirmed. Not so well known as Lucille, he asserted. Lucille? What? You do not mean that you have never read Owen Meredith's masterpiece, Lucille? Owen, I gasped, but before I could do more than gasp, he quoted, We may live without poetry, music, or art. We may live without conscience and live without heart. We may live without friends. We may live without books. But civilized man cannot live without cooks. The next instant our hostess was upon us, murmuring with a bright arch smile, Ah, Loxley Hall, those old Victorian things were wonderful in their way, after all, were they not? I knew you two dear men would be simply wild about each other. She was that sort of hostess. Those lines were printed in blue and gold, with a red border around them, in the front of a cookbook that was one of my grandmother's wedding presents. Above them was a picture of an ample and dimpled young woman in a white apron, who was smiling and mixing something in a bowl. I cannot remember the time when I was not aware that this young woman's name was Dorcas. No one ever told me that her name was Dorcas, but the knowledge somehow came to me while I was still in kilts, and it is as Dorcas that I think of her to this day. One glanced at her and knew at once the sort of things that Dorcas would cook, that Dorcas was born to cook. Never in later life have I sat down to dinner without saying to myself, Ah, things look Dorcasy tonight. Or, alas, there is nothing Dorcasy here. Do not mistake me. My affection for Dorcas was, and is, based upon nothing so simple as her air of bucolic wholesomeness. I'm no advocate of plain cooking. Dorcas was not a plain cook. She was the mistress of seven hundred complications, and in them she rejoiced. There was an apparent simplicity in the result. That appearance proceeded from the excellent art of Dorcas, which subdued many ingredients to a delicious unison. For she was an artist. But she was not a scientist. Dorcas had never studied culinary chemistry. You had tried to talk seriously to Dorcas about her gastric juices, she would have been as shocked as if you had mentioned her legs. Dorcas cooked for the sight and smell and soul and palate of man. His digestion did the best it could. She betrayed man's duodenum, and he loved her for it. I suppose the richness of Dorcas did ruin one's digestion. What then? The digestion of God that we should regard it reverently? To my mind there is something base in considering one's digestion as if it were one of the higher attributes. I like to see a reckless, adventurous, headstrong, romantic sort of eater. I like the vaunting spirit that proclaims, By heaven, I will conquer that plum pudding or die. 
Let us be sensible about this thing. An average man may eat the Dorcas cooking from infancy on to the age of forty years before he becomes an incurable dyspeptic. Suppose, then, he must retire to poached eggs and malted milk. What memories he has to look back upon! I once had a second cousin, a prudent boy, who thought a great deal of his digestion. Dorcas could not tempt him. He knew all about his alimentary canal and gave himself as many airs as a bumptious young anchorite who has just donned his first hair shirt. He exasperated me. If he had been deliberately saving his digestion for the first thirty-five years of life in order to enjoy it to the full and with more mature discrimination during the latter thirty-five, I could have understood him. But no, he intended to eat poached eggs and malted milk to the frugal end. But the universe is not on the side of frugality. The stars were hurled broadcast from the hand of a spendthrift god. Cousin Tom, going back to his office after a lunch of oatmeal crackers on his twenty-eighth birthday, was killed by a brick which fell from the chimney of a chop house, for which I sat eating a steak in casserole with mushrooms, and thinking sentimentally of Dorcas. He died without issue, and carried his gastric juices unimpaired to the grave. In a way, I took a certain satisfaction in his death, as it proved the folly of prudence. And yet I wept at the funeral. For the thought struck me, what could I not do with Tom's practically virgin digestive organs if he had but contrived to leave them to me? There was a stomach that had never really lived, and now it never would. It is better to go swaggering through the gates of life loose-lipped and genial and greedy, embracing pleasures and suffering pains, than to find oneself, in the midst of caution, incontinently slain by chance, and eaten by worms. And a preface to a cookbook.